there, if you have your Bible, and I hope you have, turn to the book of Daniel, chapter number 7, and Revelation chapter 1. Daniel chapter number 7, one hand, and Revelation chapter number 1 in the other. Daniel chapter number 7 and verse 13, the divine text says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. In Revelation 1.13, the scripture says, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. Father, bless this holy word now. In thy name I pray. Amen. We are introduced in scripture to the Son of Man. Now the Lord Jesus Christ is called the Son of Abraham, he's called the Son of David, he's called the Son of Man, he's called the Son of God. He has many titles, and there are many aspects to who he is. This is why you had to have four Gospels. This is why you have 66 books of Holy Scripture that took 2,000 years almost to write. It is because the Lord Jesus Christ truly defies description. We can only describe him as much as we as human beings can relate to the words we're using and the understanding we have of him. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How do we understand that? Well, the Bible says God is a spirit. and They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And since we do not have a clue what the essence of a spirit is, then we're left to the definition of the Bible. There's no way in the world to get past it. So what does the Bible say? When the Lord Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, he came from heaven, second person of the Trinity, had always existed. There never was a time when Christ came into being. Any deviation from that and you're a rank heretic. The Lord Jesus Christ is from everlasting to everlasting. When he came into this world, though, he uh, took upon himself the form of a servant, he said in Philippians 2, and was made in the likeness of flesh, the likeness of sinful flesh. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. So therefore, God incarnated himself as a man. Incarnate means that God and man became one. Define that? There's no way in the world I can do that. The Bible says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Mysteries are things that only God can reveal the true meaning to. You can't find out. The Bible says, canst thou by searching find out God? No. He must reveal himself. There's no other way. And of course, because of the nature of who God is, you wouldn't know where to find him to begin with. How are you going to find him? How are you going to locate him? You're going to, are you going to chase him down somewhere? Are you going to hem him in somewhere? How are you, are we talking about the Almighty. No, my dear friends. No. We've already, we're at the cusp now of creating a creature that's probably going to wind up being smarter than us. Artificial intelligence. Imagine the one that made all of this, the Almighty. So he said in Daniel chapter number 7, and this is quite a beautiful picture you see here in the night visions that locates it dispensationally. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. He told him, you'll see the heavens open and the Son of Man and his glory appearing. And he came to the Ancient of Days. Now this is one of these things that kind of blows your mind when you think about it. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I, I love to think about things in this nature, but I also know that you can only go so far with it. Uh, when God is all in all, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it doesn't mean that they go back to being uh, one unit uh, as we think of a unit. God's always been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But all in all, it means that the, you're going to see the fullness of the Godhead. And when it comes together, you're going to see that. Now, we have seen the fullness of the Godhead bodily in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it says. In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But what do we see? Well, you know, to the Pharisees, all they saw was a man. Pontius Pilate saw a man. And, but the Apostle John says, we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I believe the church of God, the apostles, were able to see deeper than, uh, than the human eye is able to see. This is what I'm going to try to get into with you tonight. As the Son of Man, he died on the cross. As the Son of Man, they beat his back open. 
As the Son of Man, he thirsted and hungered. As the Son of Man, he got tired. As the Son of Man, he suffered all the days of his life on this earth. And as the Son of Man, he was betrayed and turned into the hands of sinners. Now, the Son of God could not be, could not be violated. The Son of God in no way could be, could be murdered. You can't murder the Son of God. You can't take the life of God away. That's utterly impossible. That's an impossibility. God cannot die. So this brings us to the mystery of the Godhead. When the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross said, Father, it's finished. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Then his spirit went into the hands of the Father. Did it mean that his spirit died? No. It meant that his spirit ascended to the presence of the Father. Peter said in the book of Acts chapter number 2, Thou wilt not leave thy soul in hell or suffer thine holy one to see corruption. The word hell there is referring to what we call Hades, as I mentioned to you the other day. Now, most of the time when you hear Hades from someone, they're trying to do away with the doctrine of hell. But Hades is a Greek word, and the Greek word, we don't, I'm not interested in what Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and Maximan, or the rest of them believed about Hades. That's irrelevant. But what the Bible says about it is very important, because it is in the heart of the earth. And the Old Testament counterpart to Hades is Sheol. It is the unseen state of the dead. And so therefore, when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary, his soul, according to Peter, descended into the heart of the earth, into Hades. Now, I believe that. Now, some don't believe that, but I do. But I do not believe for one minute the Lord Jesus Christ went into hell fire because Hades has two compartments. When you look at Luke chapter number 16, when the rich man died, you remember? He saw Lazarus. And uh, 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 he saw Abraham, he said, in Abraham's bosom, and he, he said, please, uh, you know, dip your finger in water, quench my tongue, I'm burning in this flame. There was a great gulf fixed between the two of them. And he said, I cannot cross from thence to where you are, and you cannot cross from where I am, uh, from where you are to where I am, all right? That's a scriptural definition of Hades or Sheol. In the Old Testament, it's called Abraham's bosom. So now what we have is a compartment in the center of the earth, the heart of the earth, that has two compartments. It's called Hades in a general sense, and one side is hell, fire, burning, and the other side is the abode of the saints. Why'd they go there? They went there because heaven was not prepared for them because they weren't prepared for heaven. They, their sins had not been redeemed as yet. They had been forgiven. All Old Testament saints' sins were forgiven, but you see, they still hung around. It's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. See what I mean? It took the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross to literally take those sins away. And they ceased to exist. And therefore, how was that done? By redemption. But that, I want to get off into that. <laughs> That's a different study in itself. It's a wonderful thing, but we're going to stick with what we're here, we're, we're, we're with here tonight. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ identified with man in a, in a very special way. If you notice now carefully, look carefully. When he appears to the church in Revelation 1 and 2, he appears as the son of man, remember? And he has seven stars in his hands. And I offered that that would be the seven stars bishops or pastors or elders of the church, these seven churches that are, are enumerated for us in the book of Revelation. You can't prove that, but I lean in that direction because they are accountable for your souls. He holds the bishop accountable for your soul, folks. And so therefore, I have a, a responsibility, a responsibility, and I don't take it lightly. But in any event, when he relates to his bride... He relates as the son of man. But then later in heaven, we have a lamb, as it had been slain before the foundation of the world, that appears before the one sitting on the throne, and there's 24 elders gathered around it on a sea of glass. And as the lamb of God, he opens the book and loosens the seals. You see the difference now? As the son of man, he relates to the church as the lamb of God. He opens up the judgment of God upon the earth. In both cases, Son of Man, Lamb of God, qualifies him to judge. Qualifies him to judge in a way that he did not judge before. See what I mean? When the Lord Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago and lived in our midst, that qualified him to judge us in a way that God 
had never judged a man before. You see, God had never had nails driven through his hands. I don't know that God had ever felt pain, do you? But when he had a body of flesh, he certainly felt pain. Not only did he feel pain, but he also experienced everything that we experience emotionally and the relationship, the interaction that we have with each other while we're on this earth. So it's important to understand that God identifies with the creature that he made. Now you go back and look into eternity past. God has never thought of anything. Nothing has ever arrived in his mind. He has never found anything out. He's almighty God. He knows everything before it ever happens. He's the almighty. And that means that he has all knowledge. Omniscience is the word for it. He knows all things. So why would he choose to make a creature that one day that creature would fall and that he would have to go to a cross and suffer a horrendous death like he did? There's got to be a message in it, don't you think? It's for a message. It's for us. You see, it's for us. He, he could have made man and man would have never fallen because God could have made man and placed him in a state where he could not have fallen. But that's not what God intended to do. The reason? Because he made you in his image. And you can respond to God like you will tonight. You'll respond to him. Remember what I told you? Man can pray, but there's not a word in that Bible from Genesis to Revelation that says angels ever pray. Man has the capacity to love. I talked about that Sunday. There's not a word in the Bible that says an angel has the capacity to love. You think about what prayer is, what a powerful thing that is. And the ability to love, love is one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful thing. Most people spend all their life talking about something they've never had, never experienced. They go from person to person to person to find true love, and they can't find it. Love is a powerful thing. If you love our Lord Jesus Christ tonight, you know you do. And you have a reason for that because you're, you're beginning to understand the great sacrifice he made so that you could appreciate it and receive it. He made you with that capacity and ability. The Bible says in Luke chapter 15, verse 2, the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Yes, he did. You know why? Because he identified as a man. As a man. You see, he did not have to prove his deity. He didn't have to prove that. And everything he did on this earth, he did it as a man, completely dependent upon the Father, absolutely obedient to him. And every miracle he performed, he performed it by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And he said, you have that same power. But the difference is that God did not give the Spirit by measure to him like he does to us. Why? Because he was completely open to receive everything that God could possibly give him. But I'm going to tell you something. I'll tell you something. God still heals. God still saves. God still delivers. And by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, you can see these things happen. He still works miracles. Absolutely. Luke chapter 9, verse 58, And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. That's by choice. Remember, he was born where? In a stable. His laid, body was laid in a manger where you feed animals. And uh, as some folks get descriptive, they say, no doubt that place had a smell to it. <laughs> I mean, how many's ever been in a place where you have animals? Uh, they're not real uh, <laughs> kosher, you know. <laughs> so here we are. The Bible says the foxes and all that. But in Matthew chapter 17, I want you to note carefully what he says in verse 22 and 23. Matthew 17, verse 22. While they abode in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. Notice the cross is identified with what? Son of man. You see, you cannot take the life of deity. So here we have the God man. And this is one of the biggest mysteries and arguments when you get into studying the scripture. Did the Lord Jesus Christ have two totally and completely separate natures? 
Was one nature the nature of God and the other the nature of man? Was that who he was? Or was he one nature, God and man, joined together to, now listen carefully to what I'm saying, create on this earth one who never existed before. Now get this right, because this is where heresy starts, and this is where heretics bloom. The Son of God came down from heaven, second person of the Trinity, no beginning. But the Son of Man did not come down from heaven. The God-Man did not come down from heaven. The God-Man came forth from the womb of a virgin. Okay, that's the incarnation. That's when God and man are joined together. How did this happen? I can't explain that. But I believe it. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. All right, that's, that's what he, fully God and fully man. That's who he is. So when he died on the cross, how did that happen? How could that possibly happen? Once again, God cannot die. You say, well, he ceased being God. Oh, no, now, hold on. No, jump up and <laughs> grab something and run off with it. No, he never ceased being anything. What well, he said, Father, into thy hands I come in my spirit. That essence, spirit, divine that goes to the Father, that's deity. But the body was laid in the grave. The soul descended into the heart of the earth. There you have the three. Now look carefully at this. The Bible said in the book of Romans that he was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. He was not made the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. He did not become the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. He was declared. You see, these words are important. To be the son of God, resurrection from the dead. Well, what happened? All right. Spirit comes back from heaven. Soul comes back up out of the heart of the earth and unite in the body. Okay? And once they unite in the body, on the third day that body comes alive again. And now the God-man who had died is alive again. And then in Revelation 1 he says, I am he, John, who liveth, was dead, and now note, John, behold, I'm alive forevermore and have the keys of death and hell. So he's been to a place that nobody's ever been to. He's been through something nobody's ever been through. The Lord Jesus Christ has experienced something that nobody's ever experienced. And when that happened, what had to happen for the spirit to come down from above? What had to happen when the soul came up out of the heart of the earth? What had to happen when these were merged together in that body? The Bible says he was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. That meant that from that point on, the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ was fixed forever that it would never change. When he was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the identity could change because he could die. But once, he, once he's alive, he never dies again. Amen. And something happens then. He becomes the last Adam. He becomes the head of the whole new race of mankind. The first Adam is of the earth earthy. All that we are, we get from Adam. We know what we are from Adam. Read Romans 5, it's plain as it can be. From Adam, he, we inherit death, we inherit sin and all that, and that's as far as we can go. But the last Adam, the Bible says, is the Lord from heaven. And from him, then we have, what do we have? We have the life that he lives now being resurrected from the dead to never die again. Now that's a big deal. And notice, dispensationally, chronologically, the progression of it, how that once he, arri once he, ar once he arises from the dead, he imparts to us life, and that life is the life of a resurrected one. This is why he said, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And look, John, behold, I am alive forevermore. He said to the apostles, because I live, ye shall live also. Proven to be the son of God. Hallelujah. God, by the resurrection from the dead. Death couldn't hold him. He broke its power. And when he broke the power of death, he broke the power of Satan, by the way. Because Satan has the power of death. He had the power of death. And so the Bible says in John 1.14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. 
Now, the Apostle John, you know, John the Apostle, he writes the Gospel of John. Who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John? John the Baptist or John the Apostle? I'm going to keep you awake now. I don't know if you're reading the newspaper or what. That's right. John the Apostle wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Right. Is there a big difference between John the Apostle and John the Baptist? Absolutely. Absolutely. John the Baptist says, I stand and look at the bridegroom. The law and the prophets were until John. Which John? John the Baptist. But since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. It's where you are now. This is why he told them when he resurrected from the dead, go out and buy a sword. Because now you're in the world in a dispensation where they are taking the kingdom of heaven by violence. What's the kingdom of heaven? The kingdoms of this world, Revelation 11, will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. When does that happen? That happens when he comes to take rightfully that which belongs to him. How's he going to do it? He's going to make war. That's why he's, <laughs> Revelation 19, he sits on a white horse and blood flows as high as the horse is bridled. You can read about it in some of the prophets in the Old Testament. And boy, does he ever come to make war. He is coming to take back what is rightfully his. Why? Because man will never freely give it to him. All right. So he identifies with humanity. And that's, that's, that's a, that, that, that helps me to understand. And what we're looking at here is the son of man who now is qualified to judge my life as a man, and your life as a man, woman, mankind. Uh, Got to be awful careful of pronouns today. You live in a nut. <laughs> Lord, help us. <laughs> uh, I think everybody in here, every, do we have anybody in here that doesn't know what they are <laughs> tonight? Oh, good, I'm glad. <laughs> we got by that one. <laughs> I never heard anything like that in my life in school. Never, oh, Lord, help us, man. What a shape. What a mess. All right. So, he comes. And he dies, and he rises the third day. And then notice what it says in Matthew chapter 17, verse 22. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man, notice this, not the Son of God. Now, I'm not trying to say he's different from the Son of God. I'm saying this is the identity that he identifies with. The Son of Man, the Son of Man, shall be betrayed into the hands of men. So therefore I make myself as the son of man vulnerable to all that men must endure. See that? That's the point. I'll walk down the same road you walk down. I'll deal with the same issues you deal with. I'll face the same enemies you face. I'll do it all and I'll do it the way that you'll do it. I'll do it by walking in fellowship with my father. So he was betrayed. But look at John chapter number 8 and verse number 28. It's quite a thing the way it says it here now. Then the Lord Jesus said unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He. All right? That ego I me, I am. That emphatic I am. You remember when they came to Gethsemane? Remember they came to Gethsemane? And they were, uh, they, you know, they were, it was dark, I'm sure, and they were, they were, they were weren't sure who he was, wanted to make sure that he had the right one. And they came to him and he said, I am he. <laughs> what, they, what did they do? <laughs> they did what any creature would do. They hit the deck. You better believe it. Down they went. Down they went. I am. The word he is, uh, should be, I don't have it open in my Bible. If you've got your Bible, look at it. It's in italics. It means it was added for continuity. I am is what he said. That's all it took. I am. The great I am. I, like, I love that song, Mary, Did You Know? You remember that one? It's Christmas. They sing it at Christmas. I play it all through the year. I play, I play, I play O Holy Night in, in, in June. I mean, why? There's nothing said you have to play that stuff just at Christmas time, right? It's beautiful, it's beautiful. Oh, come all you faithful. Why, well, yeah, man. Beautiful star of Bethlehem. Why, well, good night. You mean, Preacher Lawson, you play Christmas songs in the middle of the year? Yes, sir, buddy. Are you, I'm ready for the funny farm. I'm happy. <laughs> so, as the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ 
vulnerable. In weakness, he was crucified. In weakness, he gave himself. There's something in there, folks, that, uh, that, 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 that could be easily overlooked. I want you to think about that tonight, about what it took for God, once he had become incarnate, to go, com to go the complete distance in that incarnation. And he did. He humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the accursed death of the cross. I added the word accursed. Even the death of the cross. The Bible said, cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Paul said to the church at Galatia. Now, if the Lord Jesus Christ was simply a son of man, a son of man, which I am, and you, we all are. We're all sons of men, every last one of us. If he were simply a son of man, then he wouldn't have been, uh, he wouldn't have been qualified. No, he makes a difference. He says uh, very carefully, uh, Luke 19, 10, the son of man is come to seek and save that which was lost. If he'd simply been born of Joseph and Mary, he wouldn't have been qualified, would he? You've got liberal theology out here teaching, well, God divinely used Joseph to bring Christ. No, he didn't. Joseph had nothing to do with it. Joseph was a good man. Don't malign his name. Joseph loved the Lord, and he was faithful. He was a just man. You'll meet Joseph in heaven. No question in my mind about it whatsoever. Uh, had he been born of Joseph and Mary, he wouldn't be qualified. He'd been born under the same curse the rest of us are born under, under the original sin. If he'd been clothed with sinful flesh, and the Bible said in four sin, condemn sin in the flesh. He had flesh, his flesh hurt, his flesh bled, his flesh died. His flesh was vulnerable to death. But there was no sin in it. There was no sin in his blood. The blood, the curse, is passed down through the father, not the mother. So, ladies, y'all take a little courage from that tonight. I mentioned that before to you a number of times. It's passed down through the father. Well, who was Christ's father? It wasn't a man. So, our Lord Jesus was made in all things like his brethren. Hebrews is good on this. Because when the Lord Jesus came to this world, he came as the express image of God and the radiance of his glory. He came as, a, uh, as, as God man giving the final manifestation of himself that's possible for creatures to have until he makes a full manifestation of himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that, my dear friend, is going to be worth all eternity. And the truth of the matter is... Uh, don't limit yourself to try to figure out what you're going to see. Uh, don't do that. You're making a mistake. If you think you've got God's, God's body and essence figured out, you're dead wrong. The Lord Jesus Christ is the body of God as far as the God-man manifests to mankind. But God the Father has an appearance and an essence and a presence that no man's ever seen. No man's ever seen the Father. That's what it says in the New Testament. No man ha has ever seen God. They've seen manifestations of them. What's a manifestation? They may see wind. They may, they may see fire. They see a dove. They see these things. These are all types. They're beautiful. But God's not a dove. He's not wind. He's not fire. Not in that sense. So there's something about that. It's probably, and I'm sure it will be, the greatest privilege, blessing, and gift that he has for creatures like us is that when he unfolds himself, and only he can do it. An angel can't do that. When he unfolds himself, and you begin to look deep into the very essence of the Godhead, that'll blow you away. It'll blow me away. That's beyond, that's, words can't handle that. And uh, if he died as other men die, and they tried to kill him at Nazareth, they tried to throw him off of a cliff, do you remember? Herod tried to kill him when he was born. Herod, so-called great. And there are other attempts on his life made, no question. But he didn't come to be killed. He came to lay his life down. Which brings us back to his deity. You couldn't kill him. He had to dismiss his spirit. If he had not dismissed his spirit, he'd still be hanging on that cross. 2,000 years later, he had to do it. 
No man takes my life. I lay it down. That's the power of God. Think about that for a moment. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. His body did not keep him alive. He kept his body alive. Now here it is with us today. The Bible says if that spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in your mortal flesh. I'm not quoting it verbatim. Maybe some of you probably do a better job quoting it. I'm just pulling it off the top of my head because it goes with what I'm saying. But if the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwell in your mortal bodies, the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies. What mortal body? The body you're in. The body you're going to live in later is not a mortal body. The first body we have is of the earth, earthy, 1 Corinthians 15. But the next body we have is of the heavens, not of this earth, okay? Well, here's the point. Here's the point. As long as the Holy Ghost is in you, you cannot die. <laughs> That's exactly right. Because the Holy Spirit keeps you alive. Christians, yeah. An unsaved man's life is no more than a dog's life. This is why the Bible says Satan can take an unsaved man, kill him at his will. Subject to the devil. He's a killer. So when God gets ready to take you, his Holy Ghost takes you, the Holy Spirit, and you leave. And this body goes back to the ground from whence it came. You talk about a good way to leave. Isn't that something? So you're saying the Holy Ghost won't leave you and then come back and leave you? No, sir. You're quoting David back there in the book of Psalms where he said, Lord, take not thine Holy Spirit from me. And you're in the Old Testament and David wasn't born again. The Bible says plainly, if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you're none of his. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God is yours forever. In this world, it will never cease. He will never leave you. If you're born again tonight, the Holy Ghost is as much in you now as he was when you were born again, saved. And he'll be in you until you draw that last breath. Isn't that a wonderful thing, though, that you know you've got a companion to go with you when you leave? The Holy Ghost. Away he goes. Now, to tell you the truth about it is I'd appreciate that because I'm not so sure I know exactly how to find my way around heaven, you know. Uh, since I've never been there before, I know there's a river of the water of life flowing from the throne of God. I know that. I know that. I know from what I read in the Bible is a beautiful place. Now, when I say heaven, I'm talking in a generic sense of that New Jerusalem, 1,500 miles square, which is only part, very part of what we're talking about in heaven. Okay? Heaven. Heaven. Greek word uranos, the heavens, declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. We're going, and the Holy Ghost is going to take me. In, uh, in, uh, uh, Norse, uh, Norse, uh, uh, Norse uh, uh, mythology. They have uh, one of their gods is Odin. How many's ever heard of Odin? Okay. How many's ever heard of Valhalla? Valhalla. Okay. Uh, how many's ever heard of a Valkyrie? A few of you have. All right. How many of you know that uh, in World War II, uh, Colonel, uh, what was his name? Uh, oh, I can't remember his name, but. He, along with some general staff and high-ranking officers, got together to try to get rid of Hitler. They wanted to get rid of Hitler and sue for peace and try to re retain as much of Germany as they could. And they almost succeeded. And, uh, but they called it Operation Valkyrie. So why did they call it that? Because in North, North mythology, when the warrior goes out into the field, un into battle, then there is an angel, there is a spirit being flying above all of this, and it's called a Valkyrie, and it determines who lives and who dies. And if they die, if this warrior dies on the field, all you have to do is type it in and Google it. Some of you will when you get home. You're going to see some beautiful art because you're going to see some of those old Norse warriors in the arms of a Valkyrie carrying them into Valhalla. All right, now that's what they saw. Now that, of course, is, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? But it's mythology. But there is one who's going to carry you in his arms into the very presence of God. That's the Holy Ghost. You say, now, preacher, how can the Holy Ghost 
be carrying all these people up into the presence of God, how many Holy Ghost are there? Just one. You see, he's a ghost, Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit can be everywhere in this world at the same time in full force and full ability. See what I mean about the essence of the Spirit? See what I mean? It's not subject to the laws of physics. And he's with you. Are you born again tonight? Then you have the Holy Spirit. He's in you. Just as surely as I live tonight, he came into me. And boy, when he did, he changed my life. Yes, he did. Hallelujah. And he hadn't left me either since then. He's in me tonight. And praise be unto God. He'll be there until he says, Now, son, time take you on to be with the Lord. And I'll say, Amen. Father, bless your word, time we've had together. We love you. We love this book. What little bit we know of it, Father, in spite of ourselves, you've taught us. It came from thee. And I pray you'd anoint the word tonight, anoint it as it goes forth. And bless in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Well, I'm done, I reckon.